All right, we got uh, we got voicemails, don't we? Yeah, let's do a couple. Anchor.fm slash the CU podcast. You go, you leave messages, you hopefully uh, don't insult us too much. Yeah. Hi, Pat. Hi, Ian. Name's Ash. Love the podcast. Hi, Ash. Um, my question for you guys is what are some video game secrets or like things that you know you discovered or unlocked as a kid that completely like blew your mind upon uh, discovering it? For me, it was uh, Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland. After you hit all the big red buttons in both normal and extra mode, extra, you know, being the half health playthrough, uh, you would unlock Meta Nightmare and you could play it through the entire game as Meta Knight. And I thought that was just so cool. And it just, you know, I was so ex- excited about it. But uh, yeah, so keep up the good work with the podcast. What blew your mind, Ian? Uh, I mean, I'm just going to go back to Mario 1. I mean, uh, the first time my parents showed me the warp zone, um, it it did something to my brain. I don't know. It was... You can skip ahead in a game? It was more like video games aren't these rigid things that I thought they were. Like, there's uh-huh. stuff hidden in them. There's, like, things to explore. I, I can't really... I can't properly explain, but seeing that was just, it opened up a a whole new world. Um, You know, I'd played video games before that, but like computer games, arcade game ports, I had never seen something as big and as thought out as Mario. You know, not only were there these whole worlds, but there were secrets. There were things you could skip. There were vines to find. Um, I know it sounds really simple now, but I'm I'm fucking 39 years old. And I mean, that's where... In Why didn't you bring it up in the, the last segment? You were gaming with relatives. It was super hard. Well, because that's, 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 that wasn't really, I don't, well, that, I guess that would have been around Christmas, but um, I was thinking like extended family. Oh, relatives um, are, are your brother yeah. and sister. And yeah. But uh, you know, seeing the warp zone for the first time, uh, yeah, shocked me. Shocked me to my core. To your core. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking at it. Yeah. I've never played through Symphony of the Night. I got to play that. Jeez, you really need to play that one. Right. <laughs> Pat, you really are sleeping on one of the greatest <laughs> games of all time, man. You have to play Symphony of the Night. Get yourself the Japanese version on the Sega Saturn no. or the PlayStation 1. Yes. I'll, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. You really, really need to get to it. I mean, it's it's available on just about everything at this point. I'll get to that. I'll get to it. I played the one on the, um, what was the DS one with the guy with the white hair? I played a decent amount of that. That's a really good one, uh, Aria of Sorrow. Uh, yeah, I played some of that one. I, I, I take some getting used to like the the sort of the, the newer style Castlevania, but no, I liked it. I liked it. That was that was, um, that was was voice message section for a second there, right? Yeah. It was like yeah, a it really loop. threw me off. Someone's going to record that and then comment on that. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be re-nested. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next one. Hey, Pat and Ian. This is John from Belleville, Kansas. Hey, John. My question is, if either of you guys lived in Vegas, would you consider being the video game experts for the Pawn Stars? Love the show. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Well, that, that, that'd be a funny job. It used to be a, um, uh, Johnny, the, Johnny the Toy Guy did it for my appearance and for a couple others. And I think there was something that happened with that. There was a falling out. And I think Johnny stopped appearing. Now it's... You know, I guess whoever's driving in the car with the person that has the sealed games becomes the expert, right? Yeah. The expert's my friend that's that's coming <laughs> along with the ride and, and talking about my sealed game. Seems uh, seems questionable. Speaking of questionable, uh, what's his name from uh, from uh, from uh, Go Collect? Well, someone sent me a link. They were on Pawn Stars trying to sell a comic. Um, the guy that that lied about keeping the Nintendo Age forums and database up. Uh, that 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 uh, nice person, and someone pointed out to me he was just on to try to push a pump a comic. Probably the same sort of thing, you know. Probably the same sort of deal, sleazy deal there. Uh, let's see, next one here. Tommy Tallarico here, and if you're wondering <laughs> where are all these Tommies coming from, I'd say, hey, if Spider Man can do it, then why not me? Okay, for people saying the Amico may or may not exist, please, people love mythical consoles. Sega Neptune, boom. Nintendo PlayStation, boom. And the Intellivision Amico, boom. And if you're still not convinced, then take it from Shiggy himself. Yeah, that's what I call Miyamoto-san these days. Shiggy, one day he says to me, Tommy, you delivered my firstborn son while we were hiking along the Sunobi River. Please call me Shiggy. So 
one barbecue weekend, he says, hey, Tommy, you know, console scarcity has worked wonders for Nintendo. And yet still people say to me, but Tommy, don't you feel bad that on Christmas morning, millions of children are going to be frothing at the mouth as they rip open their gifts, hoping for an Amico, only to be disappointed by a Nintendo Switch. And then boom, they smash it through the living room window in disgust. Well, hey, they're not my windows. Okay, that's the last you'll ever hear from me. So, audio. Okay. That's a clearly fake, Tommy. Yeah, that seems fake. But you know what? To break the fourth wall, that he he has the the the, the voice mannerism and shakiness of Tommy. Tommy. That's a fairly close how Tommy actually speaks when you listen to like like hey like, like I'm gonna have to veto uh, all further Tommies. Okay. I just. We, we can't have any fake Tommies in the show. But I'm saying that, that no. wasn't bad. That wasn't a bad impression. But we don't want, we have our real Tommy that calls in. So we can't have, we, can't, we don't want the fakes. We don't want the fakes like that. But no, I actually think that was a pretty good impression. Hey, Pat and Ian. This is Alex from Wisconsin. Uh, curious as to what your favorite junk food is you like to indulge in. Uh, myself, I am a total sucker for a Slim Jim. If I see it at the checkout of a grocery store, or a convenience store or what have you, I will likely pick it up and uh, rip into it. I don't even know if that's real meat, but by God, I love it. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Love the podcast. And remember to always snap into a Slim Jim. Yeah, that wasn't bad. Um, I, love a, uh, I love a Tabasco Slim Jim. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Thing. I don't know that. Tabasco Slim Jim. Uh, love them dearly. Um, other than that, I, I have occasionally eaten a Tijuana Mama. Um, and those are generally highly frow- frowned upon. Uh, those are spicy pickled sausages that you can get at the gas station. Ooh, that seems like a risk. <laughs> it is. <laughs> that it's seems absolutely like Rus- a risk. Russian roulette <laughs> via food. Oof, 100% God. not a great idea. Ooh, but I love God, it. I we eat gas, gas station sushi than that. Um, uh, nachos. That counts as junk food. I, I mean, I always, there's a restaurant that has nachos with like some protein, like chicken or carnitas. You're ordering them. I have to order them. I try to say, oh, it's for the table, right? No, it's for me. But it's just an excuse to get people to eat. To eat. Yeah. I got to do that. And brownie sundaes. I mean, that's more of a dessert, but like I have to order a brownie sundae as well. Like those are like the two things that you have to get uh, for sure. Uh, let's see. Next one here. Hey, Pat, me and this is Michael from Iowa. Mike. Um, just real quick question for you guys. Um, what are your thoughts on big companies buying up game studios um, like Bethesda being sold to Microsoft, pretty much excluding anyone that does not own a Microsoft product for the upcoming Elder Scrolls game? Uh, love the show. Thanks. Well, I mean, there's no choice because otherwise, like we said, these, these consoles aren't really different anymore. They're just high-end PCs, so they have to buy these companies or else there's no reason that they can't compete but from a business aspect. Yeah. Sure. But I mean, that doesn't mean I have to like it. I think, oh, it's, no. I think it's dog shit. And I think people who cheer for this because they are still attached to a console and they treat everything like fucking sports are goddamn idiots. I, I hate it. There's nothing good about a giant company buying up studios for exclusives. Oh, no, there's literally nothing good about it. It becomes uh-huh. like movies then. And yeah. now with movies, there's no like medium sized movies anymore. They're either really small. They're fucking tent pole, huge pieces yep uh, it's either you go all in on a big one or it's a small one where you know it doesn't really cost much so we can we can, we, we can make some money and who cares there's not like these medium-sized movies anymore and i probably will see we'll probably see something similar for games unfortunately you'll have your indie darlings we're already there man i mean yeah. that was the, that was the playstation 4 uh to a t and it's only you know happening more with the playstation 5 and that goes for the xbox consoles you have your handful of AAA games a year and then everything else is coming out at and indie is not the right word but if you want to use indie as a term for an aesthetic you have your 2d or smaller 3d games coming out uh and that, there, there, there's Low there's budget. there's no double a games anymore yeah which is a shame because there should be room for that there, it, it, and now it's like totally controlled by by okay well, it's like be, being counters basically yeah. that's what it comes down to there's no more there's less and less art involved mm-hmm when it comes to it, it's just we know it's going to make money. We're going to we're going to put it out from off of, of, of a, a freaking uh, uh, spreadsheet here. OK, next one here. Hey, guys, this is Eli from Canton, Ohio. I just had Eli a question Manny? for you. What horror movies do you think would make some good video games? Maybe Human Centipede, the Tiger Electronic Handheld <laughs> or Halloween <laughs> Kill for the Hyperscan. Let oh. me know, guys. Thanks. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. There was um, a thing video game, right? On on the on the PS3, or was it a PS2? There was a thing game on the PS2. I've never played it. 
Um, there was actually a Halloween on the Atari 2600. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they do they do this, but I, I yeah, I mean, something like the I, I would like to see like Friday the 13th on the Microvision. That would be cool. On the Microvision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the horror is seeing if we can play the damn thing because it's it, the, the screen's fucking gone. Uh-huh. Hey, Pat. Hey, Ian. This is Will out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Chattanooga. Pat, I often see you on social media, interacting with my boys from OSW Review, Jay Hunter, V1, and Mr. OOC. So my question for you, Pat, is who is in your boy stable? And Ian, if you're also a fan, same question. Thanks, y'all. So the boy stable is, like, who are your favorite wrestlers that weren't popular weren't like world champions like the ones that you don't think of like the ones that are like they're they're just like the the, the throwaways all right i had to think about this but i have my list, and it's usually five all okay. right the one you know disco inferno is the captain of my boys table i'm in love with the disco inferno character as a wrestler lovable loser it's ridiculous i actually thought he was a decent worker and he had the and he had the stone cold stunner rip off for a joke wrestler to have the stone cold stunner is incredible the chart buster he's one the killer bees wwf mid 80s tag team uh brian blair and i think and i forget the same one i love them and i don't know why i love them they put on their masks in order to trick the other team but the ones always one the ones um mullet curly mullet always came through the bomb so i can always tell which one was which he took off his headphones all right so that's a avatar Al Snow did this weird character called Avatar during the new generation. To- I want to say it was like 94 to 96. Did this character called Avatar. It started really cool. It was a masked wrestler. And for some reason, I really liked the character. And it became a jobber, unfortunately. But I would get so excited watching Superstars. Oh, my God, there's Avatar. It was always part of a tag team that lost. And then finally, uh, Billy Jack Haynes. Uh, Billy Jack Haynes was, a, was a, I think, a Northwest wrestler. Came to WWF for like a few years. He he had he had the uh, the full Nelson as a finisher. Um, he had his own LGN figure, I believe. He had a feud with uh, Hercules Hernandez before they, before we became Hercules. Around I want to say it was around WrestleMania three, where um, they went over who had the best full Nelson. And I'll never rem- forget Billy Jack Haynes because I watched MSG Network, uh, where they would show once a month when they did the events they would show him live uh, from Madison Square Garden. Billy Jack Haynes uh, fought. Cowboy Bob Orton was probably 86. I'll never forget it. They did a roll up with the tights and right in front of the ca- camera, Billy Jack Haynes, bare ass. I'll never forget it as long as I live full moon right in front of the camera. And I think since they, were, they did them live, they couldn't edit that out. Oh, I should have the MSG network. So that's my, that's my boy stable. What about you, Ian? Uh, I'm just going to run. Hey, uh, Hiroki, I-69. I'm going to go with him. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Stalker Ichikawa. Not familiar. Uh, Survival Tobita. This is real Japanese wrestling I'm not familiar with. Okay. Uh, and then let's see. I got to grab a couple of US ones. Canyon, I guess, wouldn't count, would he? Because he was too popular. He was popular. At, at the end. At the end, he was too popular. Yeah. Um, La Parca. La Parca was kind of popular too, but okay. La Parca was, I mean, if, if we're talking Mexico, La Parca was huge. But, but, but in even US, in WCW, he got it. He had people cheering for him i remember oh, no, I, I took i took signs to all the events for laparka yeah uh and i would need i need a fifth someone has someone has to verify the japanese ones because i don't i'm not familiar with them um yeah come on is there one from the 80s that you like that was kind of like a loser no <laughs> no not really uh, don fuji we'll go with another japanese wrestler oh jay-z kill me right, i'll do, do a couple That's what i watched <laughs> All right, a couple more here. Hey, Pat. Hey, this is Josh again. My question is, if you guys could go back in the 80s and be on a game show, what would you want to be on? Maybe Supermarket Sweep, Legend of the Hidden Temple. I'd probably love to go to uh, Toys R Us and be the kid that got the uh, shopping cart and got to put all the toys in his cart. Thanks, guys. Well, that was a contest Nickelodeon did every year. That wasn't a game show, but that would have been fantastic. The Nickelodeon toy run uh, was like the dream come true. You got five minutes in a Toys R Us. Yeah. Then, then, then if it came a fucking... Uh, KB after all, I guess it was a lost the license by the, like the mid nineties, but it used to be for years. Like that was like the fucking dream. And they did it once a year. They, they, they did one boy and one girl, five minutes shopping cart, run through a Toys R Us an empty Toys R Us. And as a kid, 
you would think about that like night and day. What would I go for? Eventually, people are right. like, oh, you get all the game slips, and you get the games, or go. I guess I guess they must allow you to go in the back and get the video games. There might have been a limit to that because you could take twenty thousand dollars worth of video games probably in five minutes at least if you just got all of them. Like, well, I I remember watching those before. I remember watching them, and it was like I, even though the video games were slips, when they did those contests, it looked like they put out specific things. So like you couldn't grab. You could oh, just really? go and, yeah, and grab all the slips. Like you could grab most of the toys, but the video game section, it looked, I remember like seeing like physical systems and boxes out. They put them out. For you, you couldn't like just say, Hey, I'm going to get 50 Super Mario threes. You know what right, I mean? Right. Exactly. You couldn't just grab a stack of the slips and then go resell them or whatever. Become the original reseller in 1988. <laughs> um, I would do fun house. I thought fun house always looked so fucking cool. It looked fun. You know, it was so hard to win. I think, I think it was like a 10% of the time someone actually won that freaking thing. It looked very hard to do that. Yes. I would do like two more here. Hey, Pat and Ian, this is Garrett over in Auburn, Alabama. I teach English at a nearby university and I'm thinking about putting together a video game studies group or class. <laughs> if you were going to teach something like this, at a university, what would the name of the class be, and what are some of the games that you put on the syllabus? Thanks so much. Love the podcast. Huh. Interesting. We were asked a question about them. We were like, what, what would you do for like a video game, like hangout thing, like a like a like a activity group? We talked about maybe focusing on a console each, <laughs> each week or each time. Wow, the syllabus for a, like a game studies class. I guess you have to do like some of the more influential games and track them through through the decades i guess i don't want to uh cop out with an answer here but my easy suggestion would be if, if, if this is a serious question like you want some help on it look at the games that the strong museum has nominated um every year for the past few years because very rarely do pat and i look at those and um go well that shouldn't be on there all of them are there for good reason and the thing that i really like about what they choose to nominate is they they're all over uh, the genres you get like you know windows solitaire doom sim city like it, they they really do a good job of covering all the different genres um and eras so I, I i would i would start there and look at what they've suggested what they've nominated um i think nomination is good enough in this instance they don't necessarily have to be winners but look at that as a pool of games to maybe check out all right two more he kept saying that. Hi, Pat. Hi, Ian. This is Aaron from Durham in the UK. This is mainly a question for Ian. When you were working at Luna, what was the worst slip up you made at the store? For example, accidentally accepting a counterfeit or selling a game to a customer for the wrong price. Love the podcast. I want to get this one in, Ian, because this is a good clickbait one. Um, so <laughs> I was, it was two Christmases ago at Luna. And, uh, and I'm still mad at these people. It was extremely busy. I was the only person. Um, on that day, I can't remember, like someone had to call in sick or something. Anyways, someone was buying about $150 worth of Super Nintendo games and someone else was buying like $10 worth of PS2 games. And I accidentally put the Super Nintendo games into the bag with the PS2 games. And I re and, and I remember Treg telling me because I, I could not find the games and I freaked out. So I called Treg and had him look at the security camera and the people picked up their bag, looked in it looked at each other and walked out the door. Oh, they knew they got extra stuff and didn't say anything. Yep. And I mean, that was on me, but uh, yeah, I, I still, I still burn up over that one. There was never anyone got a counterfeit in uh, on you. I've never taken a counterfeit. No, you don't, you don't count the NWC as a slip up. That was <laughs> I mean, that was a slip up. Sure. But I mean, it wasn't a counterfeit. It was me not paying attention to a bag full of sports games. That's true. That's true. All right. Uh, we got, we got one more. Hey, guys, don't let anybody tell you that you can't have an Amico Christmas just because the Amico is not coming out this year, okay? Because the real Amico is the friends we made along the way. Am I right, bro? I was trying to get this thing out this year, but all these people on the team were saying, Tommy, there's not even a 1% chance we can get it out in time. And I said, never tell me the odds. But can't get it out, can't promote an Atari age anymore. We do have Long Beach Public Access TV now, so there's that. And I know you guys are going to keep bashing me, but what's with that chick, Boxandra, who was running her pie hole about me last week? Listen, I'm used to taking that from you guys, but I will be damned if I got to take it from some Jersey skank, okay? All right, that was mean. It's Christmas, I should tell you. I got you guys presents. Ian, I'm giving you my Ferrari in NFT form. You'll love it. 
I even changed the oil for you. <laughs> and Pat, I got you a free jar of my bath water. Merry Christmas. Oh, thanks, Tommy. Looking forward. It's good to hear from the real Tommy. Good to hear from the real Tommy. It's good it, to hear it from is. the real Tommy. Merry, Merry Christmas to you, Tommy Tallarico. I hope you have a nice, restful Christmas. It's definitely the Miko is going to come out Q1 2022. We just know it. We we know it's not going to miss the, a fourth release date. We know no, it. Absolutely not.